So the technology that you're presenting is not dissimilar to technology that exists in places like Brazil where you have something called Crossfire or Where's the Shooting, which helps people navigate through streets in order to, buy, to avoid shooting or issues that are happening at a particular time. One of the differences between that software and this software is that software uses crowdsourcing to verify that things are happening in a particular location at a particular time. So for Canadians less familiar than this, it's sort of like a very sophisticated Waze app. Um, so if people are using the Waze app to navigate traffic or to move through traffic, this actually layers on top of it information about crime purportedly in real time, although I will get to that point in a moment. So softwares like these have tremendous amounts of potential and they can significantly affect the lives and well-being of many people, but they also bring a lot of opportunity and challenge. So every facet of social life now is being touched and modified by process of, of what we call digitization and datafication. This in turn to data as a new technical approach to an old desire to manage risk. So a lot of the questions that you're looking at are not necessarily new questions in the criminological literature and in the conceptual or legal literature. There are issues about how do we manage this problem that we call crime with the recognition that crime is a very complex social, historical, and cultural artifact that there is little constant and consistent agreement about, that it's a fluid definition that changes across time and space, which I think you acknowledge and that we agree upon. But it is also something that has been theorized by many people in many different ways. So there is no universal way of understanding this problem, and to date we still have not been able to predict accurately. Further, when we look at the technological advances such as the one that's being described here, um, in addition to the claims that it can enhance safety and security, it also represents significant infringements on human rights and privacy issues. So for AI to help humans and avoid harms to fundamental values, we need to sort of think about how we govern algorithms. And in doing that, I want to raise a couple of sets of issues that hopefully will facilitate some conversation. The first is around this concept of fairness and bias. Various types of algorithms, such as the ones that you present, various types of mathematical models and machine learning can use things called fair representation models. They can work to eliminate bias or to immediate bias or sort of at least compartmentalize it to some extent to the point where the developers are confident that they can argue that that algorithm is fair or objective or neutral. Now there's a long-standing and interdisciplinary debate about algorithmic fairness, which also extends into any form of actual risk assessment. And briefly, um, the point that I want to make here is that this debate has yet to be fully explored in a common language. There are many statisticians, software engineers, mathematicians, and computer scientists who understand objective, fair, and bias-free algorithmic decision-making quite differently than socio-legal scholars might consider fair and objective. The process of calculating and generating information is not necessarily always the problem. For many of us, it's also the data that's input into the algorithm and that's used in the back end. It's also about thinking a little bit more about what the concept of fair is and whether or not we're comfortable with the notion of predictive accuracy or predictive reliability or predictive validity as a metric of fair, or whether there are other legal moral assumptions that we bring in from law and human rights and ethics to help us understand what is fair in terms of the application of these technologies. If I move to the data for a minute, which is a heavy piece of a lot of these algorithms, is even if we're convinced that an algorithm works, um, that machines can learn, that they can learn over time, they can make good decisions, and they can provide reliable output, it's based on the quality of the data. Criminal justice data is notoriously flawed. It's what we would call, in many respects, dirty data that reflects only known illegal problem behaviors and, a range, and it contains a range of implicit and unconscious and indirect biases and forms of systemic discrimination. Further, not all forms of prime data are equal. There's often a very low threshold for the inclusion of data in these types of algorithms. So for example, if you're using official statistics, that represents one form of crime data. Victimization surveys represent a different form of crime data. Self-report surveys represent a different type of crime data. Convictions represent a different data source than charges represent. 
In terms of bias, we can take one instance that's in the, move, in the media right now quite popular, which is the instance of police carding or stop and frisk. So stop and frisk data is subject to multiple concerns about racial bias, and in fact, it's argued that it actually reflects policing practices rather than actual crime. Areas known as high priority neighborhoods or even high crime areas that are captured in what's called red zones that are now used also contain areas that are subject to high levels of poverty, racial and ethnic diversity, people with mental health issues, homelessness, unemployment, and thus the data generated from policing these areas can actually reproduce the existing inequalities of those areas. Excluding information that is predictive but biased is a solution that many developers will put forward. But this isn't fully possible or easy to resolve, because data collection, especially if it's from multiple sources or even if it's crowdsourced, will include the very information that one is trying to avoid. And so it's important to understand not only what data is being used in these algorithms, but how they're being used and how they're being analyzed. So I just want to come to another point, which is a concept that you see in a lot of the literature on surveillance studies, or what we now are moving into calling data balance. Here there's an idea that the data of these algorithms and the outputs of them will inadvertently sanction um, individuals who ought not be sanctioned. After all, what's produced from an algorithm is a probability. And there is a tendency within the field of risk assessment, generally when it's, you look at it in the context of practitioners, is to have a very poor understanding of what constitutes probability and what probability means. When we talk about crime, we have a very quick slippage from correlation to causation, where something that is probabilistic is definitely not something that is certain. There are many factors, human, social, and environmental, that will interrupt the certainty of a particular prediction at any given moment in time. So many scholars are particularly concerned, given that we can never accurately or fully predict with certainty where, what, and who will commit crime, although we can get pretty good with some of the predictive analytics. The questions around surveillance <coughs> come into play, and it's argued that what these technologies allow are new and deeper forms of surveillance, which while appearing neutral in the outcomes, um, neutral outcomes of mathematical equations, are actually reflecting a self-referential over-policing of groups. There's also scholars who've sort of looked at this from a different kind of social advocacy or human rights perspective and argue that instead of looking for issues around dirty data, we should become concerned about something called bright data. And what bright data is, as Ferguson indicates, is a focus on non-policing outcomes of the tracking of information on neighborhoods. So if you decouple the intuitive link between the crime problem and policing as a solution, algorithmic outcomes can signal social needs that can be responded to in non-punitive ways. Now, notwithstanding that, my critical sociological um, counterparts would um, say that I was remiss to say that there isn't a massive body of literature on how benevolent governance of the poor, of immigrants, or even mentally ill populations can be experienced as surveillance and social control. So in short, my point is that the concept of what is fair, or even statistically accurate and reliable in terms of prediction, is not universal or equivalent to a just, principled, ethical, or legal outcome. And it's important to point out that the concept further of live data is a myth. And it's a myth that is because really what you're getting is information produced by algorithms that are speculative projections based on historical patterns of future in a future-based model. Now the next point that I want to make is this point about function creep. Um, and again, if you look at some of the literature that looks at predictive policing algorithms, and probably most famously an algorithm that's used in Canada and the United States throughout called PredPol, or predictive policing, one of the critiques of that literature is that you see function creep. And this is the tendency to use data collected for one purpose, i.e. crime data, for another, or even visits to particular pharmacies, um, data about transit users in a particular neighborhood in our area, access to social services. All of these are databases, all of which is information, but it's collected for a very particular purpose when it's collected and it represents a number of inherent biases and limitations. Now what becomes problematic is that many algorithms take all of this data that is collected from multiple sources with various purposes and using big data techniques, they combine them into algorithms 
with little understanding of the assumptions informing that data, which is frequently lost and misinterpreted. So what you see in big data systems is emerging as separate data systems into one, which makes it possible for police to collect data that was collected for other non-criminal justice contexts, such as health, migration, border security, and social welfare. These processes have then a tendency to capture people that have no criminal justice involvement, who were never represented in official crime statistics, and now are at risk of particular types of surveillance. There's also an issue around the adoption of analytics without a specific technical purpose. So as we see more and more software developed and marketed to police forces, the question becomes, for what reason and to what end? So the development of new software and technologies are often marketed to law enforcement in various ways. And we often assume um, that law enforcement is telling software agencies and software engineers about their needs and asking about products that can help them achieve goals in the most um, accurate ways possible. But it's actually the inverse that is true. And when you look at literature such as that of Sarah <coughs> Green and others who've done research with the users of software companies like Predpool, you will find that instead of filling analytic gaps and technical needs by local law enforcement, software engineers produce new kinds of institutional demand. We also see that there are new technical players in the risk game. This is not necessarily a negative thing, because I in particular espouse um, that interdisciplinary interactions and cross-disciplinary pollinations are a good thing. However, what it does mean is that when you bring software engineers, computer scientists, mathematicians, and statisticians into a room to produce algorithms that predict, what doesn't come with that is a contextual or substantive knowledge of law or crime. They do not have the sense of being methodologically bound to the disciplinary canons or the jurisprudential norms that lawyers, um, sociolegal scholars, or social scientists, or other disciplinary experts are, and that's often missing from the big data equation. So in this case, by deinstitutionalizing criminological or sociolegal inquiry, new technicians of big data produce their own forms of independent knowledge with governance implications. The final point that I want to make in this area is one that I sort of started with, which is human rights analysis. So organizations like Data and Society and some of the other organizations concerned about the way in which data is being used, whether it's ProPublica or others, will look at these trends and not necessarily advocate that they be discontinued, that they not be used or they be limited, but rather argue that commercial uses of this type of software in the public realm for policing, immigration, healthcare, and other things should be subject to a human rights analysis. So many of the issues that we see here, we have tremendous knowledge on. And the big data, our digital term, is a space that we need to understand and think about in the context of ethics and values around what we think are just and right and appropriate decisions. And also, what are the appropriate <laughs> limits on the states, the protections of individual privacy, and who owns what data about whom, and for what can it be done? Further, within criminology and sociolegal scholarship, we need to adapt our, our gaze. We need to start to think about um, digitization. We need to think about big data technologies. We need to learn more about um, the way in which computer engineers and softwares are approaching these issues and start to ask questions. We need to think about the criteria um, that these algorithms rely on. We also need to think about the outcomes. And I think I'll just leave it perhaps at that point.